Welcome back, everyone, to the Petapixel Podcast. I'm Jaron Schneider, and I am joined by my friends Chris Nichols and Jordan Drake, as hey! always. Hi. And uh, we have a uh, we have a lot to talk about this week. Um, yeah, usually, like the, the the idea is we don't have a ton of news stories. There's a lot that happened in the last week, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna go over all of it. Uh, we're gonna talk about the 18K Big Sky Camera too. That's the mm. that's the that's the gigantic censored camera that is used to uh, make footage for the sphere in Las Vegas that constantly is in the news for doing something crazy. Uh, we have a lot more information on them than we did. Uh, we also are going to talk just briefly kind of tie into last week, Cinestill one last word for Cinestill. And then finally, <laughs> after what feels like it should have been years ago, EOS M is finally dead. Boo. Don't say that, Jaron. Let's get yeah. into it. Once again, we would like to thank our sponsor, OM System, who make the Petapixel podcast possible. OM System is celebrating a significant milestone this Friday. It's their second anniversary, anniversary, which they're calling OM System Day. For anyone who doesn't uh, remember, OM System was Olympus, uh, the camera division, and now we are OM System. And it has been two years since that transition Ooh. happened. To commemorate this special occasion, OM System ambassadors and staff have something amazing in store for the photography community. They're hosting a series of in-person and online workshops, all centered around the theme of nature. It's a fantastic opportunity to deepen your understanding and appreciation of the world around us. OM System wants to involve the community in their celebration, so from now until November 13th, they're inviting you to share what nature means to you. And what's in it for you? Well... How about a chance to win an OM5 kit, an incredible piece of photography gear, and a once-in-a-lifetime adventure, a five-day Lindblad expedition for two to Iceland on the National Geographic Explorer. That is a dream come true Can for Chris any nature Can Chris and I win lover. that? <laughs> you are not allowed to enter. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> One of those employees may not join this contest, blah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I remember years ago... Now it makes me feel ancient, but when Iceland became like suddenly you had to go to Iceland, like the pho the photography, the, photogra yeah. the photographic capabilities of what you can do there, like the the landscapes and the animals and all this stuff was just like blowing up. And I'm like, God, I want to go to Iceland. And a decade later, I've still never been. Um, have you either of you been to Iceland? No, never. we we started at DP Review like two weeks after Olymp former uh, yeah Olympus uh, did a press trip to Iceland oh, that right. Jeff I Keller went that. on, and it's like ah, we were so close. And he I was like, Man, I didn't like earlier. it that much. It was cold. It was cloudy. <laughs> I'm like, you're crazy. It's, I would love to go there. That would be a, a dream of a lifetime for sure. So, like all three of us have never been. Um, I think at yeah. Imaging Resource, I had actually just started there as well. And I think William Brawley went to Iceland. Oh, it was not yeah. me. And again, and I also probably Dave Etchells probably went too. And I was just like, uh. The but we did go to the Costa Rica thing. Just that wow. was the last we did do the Costa Rica the, yeah the Olympus thing but anyway I really want to go there go. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know people you shouldn't miss out I mean go to explore.omsystem.com slash petapixel don't miss the opportunity I would I would I love to go on a trip like this so we will vicariously live through whoever wins it so if please you're do curious that. what it's like to go on a Lindblad expedition um, Michael Bonacore, our travel editor and also traveling barista for the team, if you've watched yeah, uh, where's previous my coffee? videos. Jeez. Uh, Michael Bonacore has actually done a Lindblad expedition on this, I believe on this same ship. Um, that yeah, to it went the Galapagos. To, he went to the Galapagos. So if you'd like to see what that looked like, uh, I'll leave a link in yeah. the description below because that is worth checking out if you're interested in Lindblad That's at all. another place he, I'd like to go. Yeah, right? <sighs> Jeez. Oh, Everyone else has to do all the We fun need stuff. to go to more islands right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I'm reading the fine print on this, and they actually single us out by name as being ineligible yeah. to enter. <laughs> so, Chris and Jordan, uh, don't. So go. that's a shame. I'll send. I'll send Gordon Drake instead. <laughs> He's got a real crack at this. 
<laughs> well, as Chris said, to participate and to get more details, head over to explore.omsystem.com slash petapixel and don't miss this opportunity to connect with nature on a deeper level and potentially win some amazing prizes, including a trip to Iceland that we can't win. Share your thoughts, <laughs> share your passion, and let OM System celebrate nature with you. Um, We're not I actually got this even ad a read bit. today and I had no idea they were doing this. And I am, that is so cool. I, w- yeah. I wish I could win. I can't win. There's well, waterfalls. Also- the, the people are beautiful. The towns are cool. They drive a lot of Nevas around still. There's like Atlantic salmon fishing. Um, I'm oh, of course, there's a fishing thing. Uh, yeah. If I was a good photographer, I would have entered in a full. So I wasn't, you know, here. But like, I'm so jealous of the people who are going to be able to do that. I'm sure we'll share who wins at some point because uh, <laughs> I think it's worth pointing out. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on. Talk some news. Yeah, uh, Jordan. This one's probably the one that you're pretty excited about. Darren Aronofsky, love him. Shot the feature film that is currently airing at the Sphere. Uh, oh. it's, d- appeared on a uh, talk show and said that it takes twelve people to actually use the big <laughs> sky camera. Uh, <laughs> that's the 18k by 18k <laughs> sensor uh, for a variety of reasons and. Uh, Jordan, thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds like they were mostly coming down to cooling, which is exactly what we said when we yeah. first heard about this thing, like just the mountains of data that it is recording. Um, but I do want to quickly, um, I got to delve into this. What are your favorite Aronofsky films? Oh, I liked, I liked, I mean, recently I liked The Whale. I thought it was quite good. I thought it, it played much like a theater stage play, but I still thought it was quite effective. Well, it was um, originally a play, so you nailed it there, Chris. Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah, I mean, that that's one that comes to mind that I've watched recently. Uh, Mother was interesting. I, I do respect it. I, you know, his movies are, are, they do go quite a gamut of, are you going to, you know, he's got a lot of range. Like, is, is it going to be very heady? Do you have to really delve into it? Do you have to really open yourself up? Others are going to flow nice, nice pacing, more narrative. I mean, Black Swan, I thought was fantastic. That's probably one of the more enjoyable films. Not the subject matter, it's dark, but it's enjoyable to watch. I really like The Fountain, and Mother was certainly interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Requiem for a Dream was such an important movie for me when I was yeah. young because it is so audacious and so dark and everything. But, but I never yeah, Black watch Swan, I think, is still his masterpiece. Um, yeah, so, I, anyways, very. Co- I can't wait to see what he is doing with this camera, and that's what's kind of compelling about the sphere thing. Is the only way to see it is in this giant <laughs> space. So hopefully, <laughs> we can sort that out because we've done a few sphere stories already, and it would be very cool to have we the opportunity. Are, to check we're, that we out. are in conversation with their team, and for anyone who reads Petapixel, you'll know that we have done a couple of stories on this camera specifically including like uh we had an exclusive deep dive where we got to yeah. see the camera we sent we had an author who was yeah. there in in person who saw this camera before the sphere even opened um and we've been trying to figure out the best way that we can cover it too because it's complicated as you can imagine the sphere is quite popular so like trying to figure out how we can work our way in there is uh is something that we are currently uh working on so yes do we have Jordan, the six hundred and fifty thousand dollars to advertise petapixel's website on the sphere for a week on the outside Wait, of that the it, sphere would be ideal. Is that how much it yeah. costs for a week six hundred fifty thousand dollars i no, think 450 grand for a day so 650 is a steal for seven i mean let's do it yeah uh, quite the discount <laughs> yeah no we don't have that kind of money That's <laughs> oh uh Jordan, the other cool you, thing they would have been we... able to see our faces from space That would have been cool. Uh, The other thing that was interesting uh, in the article there, they revealed some detailed specs on the camera. We kind of just knew like size and resolution before. Um, I was kind of floored that this thing can actually read out at 60 frames per second and that Aronofsky's film is shown in 60 frames per second. Oh, uh, you automatically hate it now. Uh, well, I mean, for a documentary, I've said for a long time, I think 60 is a great choice for that. It's like, I don't love it for narrative films, but, uh, for doc, I think that's really compelling. So, um, that, and just at a technical level, it's nuts that it can read out that fast. Um, now you do also have the option to drop that shoot 120 for slow-mo effect still, but, uh, yeah, full quality 60. That's nuts. (laughs) <laughs> well, it sort of explains why they have to have teams of people keeping it cool. Because if you look at the actual size of this this camera, it's not very big. No, it's no. pretty compact. I mean, it looks like mostly lens and sensor. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, but you need lots of space for like assistance with palm fronds to keep fanning it. And that takes. <laughs> yeah, a I'm lot curious of- what that means. Like, 
uh, like a, a bunch of these people are there specifically to keep it cool. Yeah. What are they doing? I mean, why not liquid cool it or something though? Like, I, yeah, it's, it's strange. Yeah, Anyways. I think we're going to see some right now. It's all very hush hush because they're debuting footage from this thing. But eventually this thing is going to see a, a release in some format. And I'm hoping we get some behind the scenes footage that comes out. Or, you know, if uh, Aronofsky just wants to come on the podcast and discuss it with us, that would be ideal as well. So <laughs> I know he's he's a regular <laughs> listener. So yeah. <laughs> not busy at all. Yeah. Uh, okay, next thing we uh, to talk about is uh, directly related to our uh, topic last week, where Cinestill was under just fire for not only filing a trademark, but then defending it. Well, yeah. um, the, if you listen to our podcast last week, you would hear that while we mostly agreed that Cinestill had every right to defend this, and I'm by mostly thinking all of us were like, yeah, legally they had every right to do this because they were yeah. granted the And trademark. an obligation to do so. Yeah. Should they continue to do so was a separate discussion where there is we none of us, not all of us agreed. I was on the side where it's like, I think at this point, you kind of just bow and say, like, sorry, tone it down and just like, yeah, yeah. move forward. Yeah. Well, they didn't yeah. do that. No, they doubled down. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. essentially updated their statement on their trademark policy page. And it is a novel <laughs> of why they're not going to back down and i just feel like that wasn't the right move yeah i mean yeah clearly despite us doing the episode yesterday and whatever if you go to any of the analog forums i mean clearly the the general perception in the community is that they are definitely the bad guy and overreached and this is just gonna further that perception and uh yeah i think it's a terrible business move well, we'll see how it shakes out. You know, it's going to it's going to push a lot of people to use the alternatives, um, you know, and, and you could go back and forth on is everybody just repackaging the same film or are there different differences. But I mean, it is effectively very similar product that a lot of different people are peddling. So uh, it's tough because I think what this will do is is the exact opposite of what they want, which is just going to push people to say, oh, they've got a bad reputation. OK, well, let's buy it from these guys. Let's buy it from this yeah. source or from this source. And, and that's exactly, I think, why all of the other companies against Cinestill took that that stance of being like, we're being intimidated, we're being abused, we're being oppressed. And, and I think that's actually worked as a marketing strategy. Cause I think a lot of people are now going to be like, yeah, let's, let's support the little guys and let's, you know, let's help them out. And, and so I don't know what it's going to do for Sinistel, but it might not be good. Yeah. Uh, if you want to read chunks, which is what I recommend reading their entire statement is, is very long. If you want to read the important chunks, uh, Jeremy, once again, <clears throat> excellent, excellent writer for the team. Uh, he has a story that highlights the most important bits that are worth uh, reading and knowing if you intend to shoot in analog and if you are a Cinestill film user. Just stuff to bear in mind about how things are going. Uh, I am. I get the sense that this they're hoping that this is the end of the conversation. Uh, I do not believe that this will be where it ends. We will see if it continues to evolve over time. But for now, at least, I think that they're hoping that everyone just kind of moves on. Uh, we'll, uh, we will see. <laughs> um, all right. Final thing. Guys, it took oh. way too long. But EOS M is dead. Yeah. I mean... I, I think, you know, we should all just come together and just recognize, you know, Jordan and Jaron and myself, that we come together here to remember Canon EOS M and, and look back on its memory and, and Jaren, what Jaron, can you did. put some organ music under this? Keep Who going, Chris. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, and yeah, yeah. We're, just, we're gathered here today to remember a system that was taken far too soon from us. And uh, I have fond memories of Canon EOS M. I mean, they were always beautiful, so beautiful, so gorgeous so comfortable in hand everybody said so and uh, i for one had fond memories of spending time with them in atlanta georgia it was one of my greatest trips and i'll never forget it it was all thanks to that canon eos m6 mark ii and so if anybody else has any words they'd like to say in remembrance for canon eos m i welcome you to do it now i i, w I would like to say i've prepared a few words here um i'm sorry I knew the EOS M mount for its entire life. Well, much will be said about its embarrassing early days of the original EOS M. Who among us had it all together at the start? It took me years to learn to focus, and so too did the EOS M series of cameras. 
But let us remember the good years. The M5 and M6 bodies were small, but a pleasure to use. The EFM mount made that all possible. These new APS-C R bodies will never be as compact as they must drag their giant full-frame compatible R mount along with them. Let us also remember the lenses. The 11 to 22 was the first compact, ah, the extremely affordable mirrorless ultra wide. The 22 and 32 were wonderful, affordable primes that would still be celebrated if they arrived on the R mount to this very day. Sigma had cannons back as well, releasing a trio of lovely compact primes that may never even see the light of day in our mount. And finally, while the 28 millimeters built in LED lights may have dimmed forever, my memories of it never will. Well, thank you. Is it a that tragedy joke. that the EOS M series concluded oh, with more. the M50 Mark II, one of the most insignificant updates in recent memories? Sure. But let us also remember the good times of responsive compact cameras that introduced many a photographer and vlogger to the wonder of a dedicated camera. Sleep well, sweet prince or princess. I was never sure how the EOS M series identified. Oh, thank my you. Lord. Uh, thank you for that uh, moving statement, uh, I think, Jordan. Uh, I appreciate Jaren, it. Jaron, Jaron, do you have something there. you'd like to say? Yeah, I never liked the EOS M, and I'm not really going to miss it. You monster. <laughs> Oh, you monster. You know what you are? You're an R100 apologist. You you, you love that system, don't you? Oh, so so much, they, yeah. They no. took they took our baby away from us far too soon. And, yeah, I know uh, that there are people that like this system. Um I was not one of them. I think I my my opinion of this system was forever besmirched by my original mm. experience with the first ESM. Yep. That yep. was legendarily one of the worst cameras. It was yeah. truly terrible. I okay. hated it. And but I it never... felt really good in the hand. I believe I mentioned how good the hand feel is. Okay, whatever. It, does. it, it took bad photos and it was a bad user experience <laughs> and I it didn't like it. So anyway, I never used another EOS M product after that experience. And I remember when I did it too. I did it at CES. Yeah. I had it with me at CES to like take pictures at CES and it couldn't even do that well. So okay. didn't That's like it. True. Glad it's one, dead. One, one thing, if you better. haven't seen it, we, when the M first came out, released our first mirrorless party episode just to make fun of that camera. Uh, <laughs> definitely go check that out. Um, yes, you definitely They, they did come a long ways. Sorry, Chris. It did For come a long ways. No, they became beautiful. And uh, I, I want to kind of go sort of, uh, you know, an Eastern religious kind of reincarnation kind of thing, because I'm still hoping that those lens formulas will be reincarnated into the R series now, the, the APS-C RF mount. Uh, I know they won't, but they really should, because they were great lenses. They were really good and very compact, and they already have the designs. I don't know why they haven't put them in. So and anyways, the, thanks so much, R R100, for R killing. RF really... <laughs> <laughs> RF really needs those lenses too cuz there's yeah. no options really f very few <sighs> and they're all bad. Well, what was weird about this was just how it happened. Um and I I guess not that weird. Camera companies don't make a big hella no. blue about oh, when we they knew discontinue it was something. But uh it just seemed like it was out of left field. Uh they just suddenly disappeared from Canon USA's website for one. Just yeah. suddenly gone. The cameras were gone, but the lenses were still listed, but all were out of stock, stock except one. Um, and but then in Japan, they're like, no, nah, no, nah, they're dead. Uh, they put yeah. them on the discontinued list and gone. It took 24 hours for us to get an actual confirmation from Canon USA, in which they said, uh, shipments in the USA region have been terminated. The EOS M series lenses and cameras will no longer be available in 2023, along with the discontinuation of the EOS M series cameras, which is different than what I saw because the lenses were still technically available on the website. Right. Yeah. Um, Are they going to keep it in Japan or is no, that going to go to? No, In Japan's wow. website, that's the one that actually gave us the true confirmation because they moved it from active wow. to discontinued. So it's like, dead. I, so, you know, a lot of our viewers might be aware, but like... Japan, the actual market of Japan, China, Eastern Asia, they, they often have so many lines of cameras that we just never hear about in Europe and North America, right? Ones that have either we thought were gone, but still run there or ones that are run that we would never get. So it's kind of neat. You always wonder, oh, maybe they're going to keep it for the Japanese market because it was quite popular there. But it was the only cute. reason it existed. Like it, this probably and adorable. Sh this should have happened four years ago, but they were selling so well yeah. in Japan that they just kept yeah. doing it. And I guess they decided to keep offering it here in the States, but there was really no new support. Even that you mentioned it, the, the Mark two, the M 50, was it? M 52. Like, yeah. Yeah. Was not, was a firmware update. 
It yeah. was not yeah. a real camera update, but it was, I don't know. Yeah. Well, so and we go. never even saw the M2 and M3 in North America. Those early models no. after the disaster of the original M, uh, where they were starting to <laughs> work out the kinks, they waited right for a M6, while till like the M5, I believe, uh, was oh, the M5, first one. Yes. Uh, that made its way back over here. That was but I, I mean, I could see pe- some people being frustrated because, yeah, there is still so much to um, recommend that system. Like even when we did the R100, we were like, the M50 Mark II is still a better camera with more yeah. native lens support. Uh, and it's really unfortunate that we haven't seen like these formats come to the R to make it like a very smooth transition. But, but we all knew find it. I mean, a good I remember when- price, I'd still grab some yeah. M stuff. I mean, we were at deep review then still, and I remember when they said, okay, now APS-C is coming out for RF mount. We were all like, oh, yeah, well, that's it. M's dead. Yeah, like, M's dead. Yeah. 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 It's, Canon it's basically confirmed when, that the, this was going to happen mm-hmm. when they were yeah. positioning the R100. They, they, they said, this is for people who enjoy the, the Rebel series and EOS M cameras. And that was like, okay, so you're, that means that's the end of the EOS M system then. And yeah. yeah, that's what happened. Um. All right, so let's move on to our main story today. And before we bring on Jim, Jim Casson, uh, who is the technical wizard behind all of the information that we have been sharing recently, uh, I was wanting, Chris, would you lead us into that? Explain the situation as best you can. So give us some yeah. context. So the GFX 100 version 2 has come out. And the big tagline that Fujifilm put out was that this sensor now reads out twice as fast. And manufacturers are never um, open with what wafers are using, what silicone, all that kind of stuff, right? But we started surmising, okay, well, if we've got twice as fast, maybe they're putting uh, multiple A6700 type sensors in there, you know, because they read out faster. Like, this could be really exciting. Brand new sensor. And, well... What we then soon discovered was the story was more complicated than that. And Fujifilm was really not, uh, you know, upfront about, oh, okay, this is what's happened. This is what's changed, which makes sense. I mean, no manufacturer really is. They like to keep that secret. But a little bit of digging, we started to see cracks and like, where's this two times speed coming from? And then experts like Jim Casson did some research and they figured out the facts. So you'll definitely want to stick around and listen to our part, part here because he really goes into detail on what's actually happening in the background. All right, so we're joined by Jim Casson. Jim, thanks for joining us here today, and uh, we're happy to have you. And uh, hopefully, you can shed some light on this whole Fujifilm GFX 102 mystery. We we really need help here. Okay. <laughs> so, Jim, uh, I, I, when the Fujifilm first announced the sensor, they made some claims that we've never seen before from one of their medium format cameras. So, can you take us into you know what what kind of sparked that? What were these claims, and and why did everybody then think like, oh, this has got to be a brand new sensor? Well, they, as I remember, they said it was a new sense. And uh, uh, it's possible that, uh, I'm going to go back to the Bill Clinton thing in the 1990s, Bill was made a uh, question and he, he got down to, what is the definition of is? And uh, <laughs> this is this is gets, gets down to what is the definition of sensor view? Right. And if the sensor is the piece of silicon, I don't think it's new. I think that it's uh, the same old piece of silicon they've used before. They've said they use new micro lenses, uh, and I'm willing to believe that. I, I don't have any, well, I have a way to test it, but it's kind of complicated. I haven't done it yet. Um, and um, I think they, they're they using the sensor in different ways. I mean, the Sony sensor that they have been using has lots of different modes, and they're using a new mode that they haven't used before. Mm. Um, so it, it, in that sense, it's new, but the sensor isn't new. I, uh, you know, right. My, what I call a sensor is a silicon. <laughs> right. I, I remember being really surprised when I, I saw that, like the, the big tip off was that when you're shooting the full sensor in 14 and 16 bit, the readout speed was the same as what we'd seen before. Um, yeah. that was kind of our clue, uh, because so much of it was based around like, look, we've got this sensor that reads out twice as fast as before. Like I remember yeah. very specifically seeing that, um, were you surprised when you initially <laughs> ran those tests? Cause I think you got this camera before anybody. Uh, well, I got it. You know, right the day it was released, uh, uh, and uh, so I didn't have any advance for it. I have no contact with with Sochi. Uh, you know, I just buy my cameras like everybody else. Uh, yeah, I was a little surprised because I they they said it was faster, and it's not faster in 14 bit and 16 bit mode. It's exactly the same speed. 
uh, made me think it's the same sensor. I actually thought it was the same sensor before I did the test, so I was kind of suspicious anyway. And mm -hmm. then uh, I found out that in CH mode, it does read out faster, but the downside is it does it with 12 bits uh, precision. So instead of 16 or 14 bit precision, which the uh, other two modes are, it's uh, it's got less precision, you know, and, and I don't think practically it's going to be a problem because I don't people see see people using uh, uh, CH mode at uh, ISO 80 or 100 or something like that. I think they'd be using it at uh, higher ISOs, and there'll be plenty of noise at those ISOs to dither over the 12 bits. So I don't think that's a practical problem. It's just more uh, an issue about why didn't Fuji tell us this stuff. But yeah, so are, that, that's, been, that's the thing I think that is not necessarily getting through as like the whole point of this exercise of where you go through and you test all this stuff and you have all this data and practically it will affect very few people most of the time. So like the question that a lot of people come up with is, why does it matter? Jim, why does it matter? That they go to 12 bits? Yeah, I don't what, think what, it, what, but I, what, what, what do about it test. does matter? I'm going to do a test, but and I suspect it might matter at ISO 80. Uh, but if you've got the the precision of the ADD converter is less than the read noise, you have the possibility in the shadows for getting posterization and some weird effects. Uh, you know, it happened with other cameras. It happened with the 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 Nikon D850 and D810 in 12-bit mode. It, happened with some Sony cameras in 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 12-bit mode uh but I practically you know it's one of these things that testers like me find fine but uh and people ought to know about it but uh I don't I think the way most people are going to use a camera it doesn't matter at all right. but the I whole mean, reason you bring content. it up yeah the whole reason you bring it up though is because this was not revealed well yeah. I mean, actually the whole reason I bring it up is because you know, I'm kind of a camera nerd, and I like to reverse engineer <laughs> cameras, uh, and uh, we're going to find out what makes them tick. And uh, and then after I find out what makes them tick, then I can answer the question about how does that relate to photography? And often, you know, it doesn't relate to normal photography at all. Sometimes it does. Yeah, I mean, the one thing so that really jumped out to, to me people. is, um, like you say, this is a professional tool, um, and people just weren't aware of this limitation. Like I could absolutely see shooting a like series of portraits or something like that. That's where I put it in continuous high all the time to ah, just get okay. exactly that right facial expression, especially if I'm working with strobes or something like that, I'm shooting at base ISO. Um, as a professional photographer, I would want to know, you know, that I am actually throwing away a little of my image quality when I switch over to continuous high, if I do need to push those shadows. What I find frustrating is just that you had to discover this. Um, and obviously, we haven't had a chance to test the camera yet. We're still waiting for a review sample. But uh, I'm glad you stepped up and gave people this information because, yeah, that's a perfect example of where I would Dang. grab a medium format camera and might be surprised that all of a sudden my image quality is suddenly worse. Yeah, is it not the point of medium format? Like, why else are you investing in a $7,500 large sensor, larger sensor? I mean, Fujifilm has called it large format well, in the past, which I find comical, but like larger sensor than typical then if nothing else really matters to you except image quality like that's the entire reason you do medium format and like sure i guess adding the extra frames per second is a really you know it on paper sounds like a really cool addition to something that has typically been limited because of the size of the sensor before like we could never do this before so they're saying now you can do it with no downsides except there are downsides that they didn't yeah. tell us about well, a lot of camera manufacturers these days are producing cameras that have a really broad usage spectrum. The the Nikon, uh, the Z9, uh, the Sony A1s, uh, even the D850, they went in that in that direction. And uh, I, I think, I mean, it's not the way I use a camera, but some people want a camera that can just do a lot of things. So you could operate it in single shot mode, ISO 80, and, and get really high image quality, and then you can uh, 
they're operating in CH and and uh, if you can find it long enough months, take pictures of sports and they get decent image quality. I don't think you get any other image quality that a that a you know a Nikon and Canon full frame camera with a nice long lens on it. But uh, you know, it's, it's a, for some reason they 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 want to do that, and and, and I wish they could just concentrate it on more megapixels on the sensor and. Uh, but then again, they're limited. I don't think they have the volume to say uh, we're going to design our own sensor or we're going to commission Sony to do a clean piece of paper design. I think they have to pretty much take a variant of what Sony has in the in their their card spin, and um, it looks like the only 150 megapixel sensor Sony has in the card spin is too big to fit in the GFX. Yeah. yeah. You know, it seems to me like it's almost a marketing issue because I think the big thing, just to give context to the viewers, is when we first heard this camera, they were advertising twice the readout speed, which is a big deal, right? So we're getting excited about video. We're getting excited about photography capabilities. You know, it, it, is this a big step up with a, a sensor that can now do fast sports in action? I mean, that'd be really exciting. Less rolling shutter, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and I guess really the marketing issue was, and what you discovered for us, Jim, was, well, yes, it does two times read out, but only in certain situations. Do you feel like Fujifilm would have been better by saying, hey, it's basically the same camera, but now we have this new sports mode that unlocks other photography and, and other applications you wouldn't normally be able to touch with the medium format? Or do you think they made a mistake by just saying it's twice as fast? Everybody's thinking it's a brand new sensor, brand new wafers, and, and that turns out not to be the case. Well, I'm with two minds on that. Uh, uh, I, I realized that uh, my life would be a lot more boring if all the camera manufacturers told everybody exactly how their cameras work. Uh, I put Same. me out of, the, out of what passes for a job. I get nobody for this. It keep, <laughs> keeps me off the street. And uh, But on the other hand, uh, from the point of view of the, the photographers, I think, the more information you have about how a camera works, the better you are to bend that camera to your will. And uh, uh, so it's only provided more information that the developers would be better off. Uh, then again, uh, you know, they wouldn't need you guys either, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I have another question here, Jim. So now that you've actually, you actually have the camera in your hands, as we said, we haven't played with it yet. So, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, there it is. Literally, so literally given, in his hands. <laughs> given that it's effectively, when you're not using continuous high speed shooting, the same image quality as GFX 100, what are you finding uh, that you do enjoy about this new camera beyond the sensor? Well, I like the build quality. I like the, I, I'm embarrassed to say that, that I, I really like the strap lugs <laughs> that are hanging out of the side of the camera. Uh, I like the, the tilted screen. I like the way that all the controls work. Uh, and the uh, this little push button on the back, you know, often when you were turning it, you would push it in the older camera. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, the joystick is improved. It's still not my favorite, but uh, all the other controls I think are really nice. Uh, I think. So, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. And I like the 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 new up to date uh, card. Yeah. Nice. Mm. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, like we've talked a little bit about the, like one of the disappointments of the camera in that 12-bit mode, but also I think Fuji really underrepresented, and your findings definitely bear this out, how good that new ISO 80 mode is on it. I mean, if yes, you're always so. shooting at base ISO, this is an improvement over what we've seen with the previous GFX. Yeah, it is an improvement. It's not as much of an improvement as they said. They talked about a, a third, they didn't use the word for well capacity, but they talked about it. A thirty percent improvement in something that translating in my mind to full well capacity, and I get, you know, a modest improvement. So you know, it's better at ISO eighty. It's not that much better. Uh, initially, in my tests, it looked like it was a lot better, but last night I finally broke the code and and uh, uh, 
you know, it's a little better. <laughs> so explain that then. That was what I was going to ask you, Jim, because uh, since we've covered your original findings where you're like, it's inexplicably better at ISO 80, and we asked Fujifilm about it, and Fujifilm was, gave us an answer that was unhelpful in understanding why it's better. Um, from what Jeremy, who we had on last week, and, and he's the one who covered your, your uh, findings, what he told me, um, he seems, let me know if this is correct or not. He says that what you found is that instead of having the noisy black pixels, if you take something where it's a pure dark, it's just replacing those with pure black so that there is no noise there. Is that accurate? Yeah, or uh, that? yeah I mean, that's the general idea. Um, uh, there's something on the sensor called the black point, and that is, if, you know, that if you, uh, that's the, the spot that should show up as, as black in the, in the output image. And uh, if you've got read noise, you have a, a Gaussian distribution, you know, a little haystack on both sides of that. And years ago, 10, 15, 20 years ago, Almost all the cameras manufactured would subtract out the black point. So you just got half of the hand step, you know, because everything else was, was below the black point was ignored. Uh, and that was a minor problem. I could get into the details of why it was a, was a problem. Uh, but they've almost all gone away from it. And this camera, it only does that at ISO 80. It acts... Mm -hmm. Perfectly normal. It doesn't subtract the black point at any ISO side of that. But in ISO 80, it changes the black point from uh, 1024 roughly to 64. Uh, and then it lops off everything that is less than 64. So in my test, you know, it looks like there's half as much noise because I was a dummy. I usually the first thing I do is look at the histogram. In this case, I didn't look at the histogram. Uh, of that particular ISO 80 mode until last night. And and then I went, oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, I blew it. Because uh, that explains the, the read noise being, being less than you would thought, because they, they chopped off half the read noise. So, uh, now, as to what difference this makes, uh, I have a philosophy that you don't want to do anything in camera that you can do at least as well at post. And this violates that philosophy. And if they do it perfectly, it's probably okay. There are some operations that that uh, you'd like to have all the redoers available for, but they're not essential operations. But if they screw it up, especially if they think the black point is is higher, and they chop it off higher than, than the actual black point, what you do is you'll get color shifts in the shadows, and in most lighting conditions, you'll get green mm -hmm. chapter. And uh, uh, I haven't tried that, but you know that 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 where the black point is depends on where the camera you're looking and the temperature and the phase of the moon and and, and lots of things. So it's it's always better, I think, to do it to do it later. But it's probably not, you know, just a killer. Uh, unless you run into the great, great shadows to do it the way they do it. Right. Hmm. Um, you guys have any uh, last uh, questions for Jim? Yeah, I mean, uh, the one question I had is now that you've you've shot with the X2D, GFX100 series bodies, is this the best image quality that we've seen out of this sensor? Is this the best implementation of it so far, or is there one that you prefer? Yeah, I'd call it a tie with the Hasselblad. I mean, half of that is ISO 64. Yeah. Uh, but half of that, I mean, they do, part of that they do with, uh, I think, a stronger CFA, color filter array. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't see much difference in the image quality and base size. So between the two cameras, I think it's mostly down to the, the lens selection and uh, whether you want a simple interface and uh, how you feel about beauty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Jim, I have a question, you know, from a consumer standpoint, um, <clears throat> you know, excluding you who have every single camera that they've made. Um, <laughs> if somebody already had a GFX 100 or they had a GFX 100 S, for example, is there enough, you know, fr from their standpoint, would it be worth getting this camera or would you hold off? You know, are the improvements that minor? If you're unhappy with your GFX 100 S, uh, I would keep it. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't upgrade 
just for that reason. Uh, I think uh, if you've got a DFX 50, I, I get a lot of slack for this, but, but I basically argue that, that, that uh, if you bought a bunch of GF lenses and you've got a DFX 50, you ought to upgrade to the 100 megapixel camera. Totally. Yeah, I agree. Great. Cool. I appreciate you uh, coming on and, and demystifying that whole thing for us, Jim. And uh, yeah, shedding some light on something that I don't think a lot of people are are knowing about or a lot of people aren't eager to find out about. Certainly Fujifilm not eager to to point it out. So, yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Jim. Appreciate Thank you it. so much, Jim. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So, guys, before uh, we move yeah. on to, you know, regular, I just wanted to ask if you had any closing <laughs> thoughts on that. Um Basically, here's where I stand. For $7,500, I would expect the specs that I see on the box, on the website, and on the marketing to be accurate. <laughs> to me, that is the bare minimum. Just yeah. tell me the truth. And in this case, the camera doesn't do that. It doesn't tell you that you've been reduced to 12-bit. And if you look at the pictures in any EXIF data, if you like taking a look at those in any software you're using, it also won't tell you that. The camera yeah. embeds yeah. in the file that it is indeed higher when it's not. And I just yeah. feel like this wouldn't be a story, this wouldn't be an <laughs> issue if it was just simply revealed that, hey, if you want to shoot faster, it's going to cost you. We're giving you the option to shoot faster, yeah. But just bear that in mind. Then it would I don't nice think time. I would have a problem with this. Just tell me. Yeah. But I mean, doesn't. like Jim said, like, you know, Nikon has done this before. Sony's done this before. But we've they been tell you. Press, yes. Yeah. We've been in those press meetings where they're like, oh, and we've got this amazing new feature. It can shoot blah, blah, blah frames per second. You're going to love it. And then in small fine print, you'll see, you know, reduces to 12 bit mode with an asterisk. And then you ask them, oh, uh, is it the same bit rate? And they'll be like, no, it's not. I mean, it does drop the bit rate, but you get this amazing blistering fast. I mean, at least at least you have a context and the reviewers have a context to then educate the public. Look, this is an option. You get that ha faster speed. And like you say, Jaron, I think Fujifilm could have marketed this in a way where they say, hey, our new camera has this higher speed mode to unlock different kinds of photography. Correct. You know, there's a there's a minor image quality hit that that you can trade for this. They could have marketed it as a sports mode or as a yeah. street mode. Just or tell me, right? It's not a yeah, big deal. But, just tell me. But and to just but to announce so blatantly, yeah, it's two times faster, which you know is going to get everybody stirred up, uh, and uh, then not really give the context. We also uh, asked means them. that we're thankful we've got guys like Jim to help us out. We asked them twice. We gave them we because we had we have receipts. We have Jim's yeah. receipts, so we had this information, and we're like Fujifilm, right? Please. Tell us. What's going on? <laughs> no comment. They chose to comment, yeah. no comment, twice. So it's just it's just frustrating. I don't like that. Yeah. But we got the truth out. That's what we do. And uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, leave those below and we can elaborate on on what Jim was saying. One other thing I do want to point out is uh, Jim's blog, if you're looking for technical information, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I should have mentioned that while he was on. And if you're looking at medium format and want to compare any models, he has them all. And on the DP Review forums, he's like, I got an afternoon. I'll run a test on that. So <laughs> if you're curious about anything, hit him up. He's one of the moderators over there. Yeah. And yeah, it's shocking how much time he'll put into finding out answers to questions. So he's a good dude. So, what have you been up to, Chris? Jordan, what are you guys doing lately? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, You've got a thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I actually looked at this book again. This is, uh, this is from a photographer, uh, Wang Wusheng. And this is... He was a photographer who, who grew up in Anhui Park Province, and he photographed the Yellow Mountains, and it's stunning stuff. Like, and this kind of got me thinking with the GFX. I was like, oh, he went up there. He did a lot of actually uh, 35 mil shots, which you would think is crazy. But if you ever look at these mountains, they're, they're crazy. They're beautiful. They're majestic. They're very vertical. And so you can only carry so much stuff. And he was a mountaineer. Uh, really dedicated his life to this. But uh, he shot a lot of Mamiya. He shot a lot of Hasselblad. This is what medium format's really good for, is this kind of high-resolution landscape photography. And it's black and white, and it's gorgeous. And anyways, I love this book. I love the photography. And if you're out there and you haven't had a chance, definitely look it up. It's, it's stunningly beautiful stuff. Cool. Uh, I, this week, followed a Chris Nichols recommendation. And my wife no, you and didn't. I are watching The Terror. 
uh, which I believe we were shouted at on this very podcast. That is correct. Uh, yeah. I, can, I can confirm. Yeah. And uh, how many episodes have you seen? I have now seen two. We watched you another one You saw one last night? night? Yeah. Because uh, I so, shouted at you again yesterday while we were shooting because I said, how many have you seen? You said, I've only still seen the first. Yeah. No, I, I said like, hey, I could be editing what? an episode that's coming out later this week uh, and make my day easier today. But no, I, I watched a show. And as Chris said, it is, it's very good. Uh, so, oh! um, now the one thing I will say, um, oh. that Ev pointed out that was kind of lingering in the back of my head. She's like, this is a very sound stagey looking series, um, which is kind yeah. of interesting there. Very little of it was shot on location and it's about people like dying in the Arctic. Um, so it's, it's kind of fun. I likened it to when you go to a museum and they have a big, you know, standy of like, look at the explorers out dying in <laughs> these terrible conditions. And they're just using like foam for the snow and stuff like that. It's not that bad, but uh, it is a really interesting look. It almost makes it feel a bit more like, you know, a play or something like that. Yeah, um, I like But that. Uh, the acting is outstanding. Historical. It's very good. So yeah, um, I can also joined. attest, we're going to keep watching. That's the biggest compliment we can I'm not going to stop the show. guilt trips and the abuse until you've confirmed that you finished. I'm this. doing what you asked and it takes time. So uh, Chris, if this makes you angry, good. Uh, I have decided <laughs> to uh, listen to a recommendation, but it wasn't yours. Uh, uh, I've, I've started Poker Face. Yeah, right, and it owns. It's very good. Yes, uh, yeah. I'm I'm quite pleased with it, um, and I'm having a fantastic time watching it. And uh, thank you for the excellent recommendation, Jordan. You're the only one who ever recommends anything for me to watch of my friends, and I just appreciate it when you do. <laughs> what that. are you talking about? I told I'm, you I'm watch- glad that I could step up in that moment of need. Uh, yeah, I wish no, other oh, people would I, offer recommendations. Seriously, to you. I didn't I really ask. Do. I told you to take that to role in our friendship, Jaron. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I, well, one last thing I want to share and, um, I'll, I'll put the picture of it here. So I, as you all know, I've I recently moved and I have to deal with, uh, you know, the stuff that I, that owning a new home comes with. And one of those things is there are a lot of plants on this property that are either overgrown or ugly or both. And I've decided to start taking some out oh. and I spent, I mean, I fought this this if, if you want to talk about like something that's just like a it deserves a whole movie of its own where one man fights like old man in the sea style against this bush where i i did combat with this thing for an hour trying to get its root ball out and it was miserable and i finally <laughs> did it and i'm like great now i can till this soil with my my new rototiller that i have acquired and i get it out there i get it into place and i pull that that starting rip cord and that cord keeps coming and it's in my hand and the oh, no. uh, rototiller is on the other side of the yard. Yeah. And then sharks came and they ate your rototiller. Hey, that's right. Mm, I now have to go take it apart and replace that whole unit, which is so fun. That's exactly what I wanted to do after being exhausted fighting with that, that root ball for an hour. So wow. sad days for me. I yeah. tore up so the, the moral of this podcast is never purchase uh, a residence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just don't do it. It's not worth it. It's it's exhausting. But some and of those plants might just need some TLC. Maybe move to different parts of the of nope. the property, like used as They're features. They're just ugly. Don't like them. <laughs> oh, them out. You're just gonna end up buying them again at the probably. garden center. You're you're probably right. <laughs> I am. <laughs> that's that's I've how done it goes. It. Yeah. Uh, okay. There. Well, my uh, my story of woe over. Let's move on to tech support and never read the comments. We're going to start with tech support, of which we have so many. They mm-hmm. never stop. Uh, so I got one here from um, Greg Pan- Pantel- Pantelides? Pantelides. Pantelides. Is there a relationship between pixel density and perceivable diffraction given a fixed sensor size? Would I be able to notice the effects of diffraction sooner on a 40 megapixel versus a 26 megapixel APS-C sensor? Would you also be willing to discuss the effects of pixel density on low light performance given a fixed sensor size? There is so much conflicting information on the internet. And I would truly value your wisdom. Thank you all (laughs) so much. I'm on team, no, it doesn't really matter based on megapixel count. I mean, yes, as diffraction sits in, it'll cover 
more smaller pixels, right? Like 40 megapixels on a full frame, they'll generally have smaller pixel pitch. You're going to cover more, but at the same time, you have more megapixels. So really, I put diffraction in terms of what's the actual sensor size itself uh, as far as what kind of effects it'll have. And I think diffraction gets uh, maybe a badder wrap than, than it should. I mean, diffraction is as you close down your aperture, you are going to start to lose some resolution. You lose some, you basically get softer images, but there is a balancing act where diffraction will cover up certain aberrations that would take away from image quality. So that's nice. It eliminates those. And then even as you go, I mean, in this term, full frame, I still am perfectly fine shooting F11, even F16. You're going to get diffraction starting at F11, F16. But if you're hand holding a shot, it doesn't really matter anyways. You're not going to notice that softness because you're hand holding it. Maybe on a tripod, very still conditions, you might be giving up some sharpness. But you might also get more depth of field, which is more sharpness in different areas that you might want. So <clears throat> I think it's a balancing act. I don't try to go to f22 or f32 very often things will get very soft there and there is something called diffraction limitation or diffraction limited where the benefits of any sort of uh, increase in aperture are completely outweighed by the softness that you get so yeah it's a balancing act but don't be afraid to shoot like f16 even f22 once in a while that's my opinion. Yeah, I, I think the important thing to remember is having a higher resolution sensor isn't introducing more diffraction. It just makes it no. more apparent uh, because you have more detail there. You can see more clearly when that detail starts to go away. But again, um, only if you zoomed in absolutely. one to one. Yeah, yeah, if you if you shot, you know, at a smaller aperture like, you know, F16 on a 24 megapixel and a 60 megapixel full frame sensor and printed them both the same size or viewed them at the same size, uh, you're going to get similar sharpness on those, although a little more because you've got more resolution on the high res body. Uh, so, yeah, I do think that's a really common misconception that Chris explained very well. Oh, good. Thank you. And that kind of goes into a second question, which we talked about last week about low light performance given uh, megapixels. And we talked about how, yes, more megapixels means smaller pixel pitch means maybe, you know, less light getting to the micro lenses being gathered by smaller photodiodes. But at the same time, you have more pixels. So it kind of is a wash. You don't necessarily, you know, unless you're unless you're going to really zoom in again, you're not really going to notice that extra noise because although there is more noise with a higher resolution sensor, it's also smaller pixels. So the noise is more, but smaller kind of equals out. One of my favorite videos we ever made was the um, debunking that myth uh, of less pixels is better low light performance. You can find it on the DP review channel. It has a terrible thumbnail that looks like a street fighter versus <laughs> sign. So it's easily identifiable uh, yeah. when you see those garish colors. So check that video out. And yeah, yeah I do think it really explains yeah. this in a little more detail. And then if you were to print out a photo on that higher megapixel, 40 megapixel sensor larger, yes, you'll see the noise, but you're also getting a much larger picture, right? And then you're not going to stand at the same distance to look at that picture, even if, if you even print anymore. Who prints anymore, bro, right? So yeah, I mean, there you go. But it's a very good question, Greg. And I appreciate you asking if we're willing as opposed to telling us to do it. Uh, whereas when I give recommendations for what TV shows to watch to my Here fellow compatriots, I tell them. I yeah. watched, the, I'm watching the show right now. You can't I'm, actually I, be I, angry about this. But I got to stay on you. Him. I got to stay on you. I got to, I got to keep uh, on you or else you'll, you'll quit. Uh, next question is from David at, uh, Ivanyuk. He asks, I mostly shoot with the GH5. I, this is an email, by the way. This was not a comment. So this was sent directly to us. I mostly Ooh. shoot with the GH5. I noticed that Jordan loves vlog for most of his shooting. This is true. I don't have a v, I don't have vlog installed on the camera and I'm forced to shoot in natural. Is the Rec 709 profile better at recording colors than the natural profile? And how does the noise level in the shadows perform on Rec 709 versus vlog? Thank you for and love the show. Hmm. Perfect. So um, I do prefer the look of the 709 like profile. Um, it's just a tiny bit more flexible in terms of if you're going to play with those files a little bit after uh, than any of their photography profiles. And I do love the colors straight out. Like if you're manually dialing in your Kelvin color temperature, I find it's very accurate and doesn't require a lot of work. Right now I'm in like 709 and you can see it looks really, really nice. Uh, if you're watching this video on YouTube. Um, one thing I will say with the GH5 is we had one with the vlog and one without the vlog profile. And a trick I use all the time is you have to pay for vlog, but the HLG profile, their HDR profile, 
profile is built right into the camera and actually offers you more dynamic range than any of the profiles that we've just talked about. So what I would do all the time is low contrast situations like this where it's lit. I would use the like 709 high contrast, you know, outside midday, uh, switch it over to HLG and without spending money on vlog, you will get a nice DR bump. Um, cause the GH five was one of the last cameras that used their old, um, vlog L profile, which actually didn't have a ton of DR and was a little tricky to work with. Uh, I really like the full vlog profile, which now they've put on most of their current bodies. Um, that is a huge upgrade that I think is absolutely worth it. But on the GH five, I'm still totally happy. Just shooting HLG. You'll get a nice DR bump. What a hack. I like it. Like, you know, camera hack. <laughs> no, you're not a hack. The, what, you just, <laughs> what you just suggested is a hack. I'm going to move on. Uh, another email we got from WC Kennedy 15. I am spending 12 days in February on a Norwegian coastal ferry trying to get images lucky. of the Northern Lights. I know. Very lucky. Just like Everyone's the going thing. on amazing trips. I know. Yeah. We're stuck in basements. I'll be using a Nikon Z8 with either a 15 millimeter Lawa F2 or 20 millimeter Nikon F1.8 lens on a tripod from the deck of the ship. I have read conflicting comments on the value of a neutral night filter. Some oh. photographers say they never use any filter. Some recommend the night filter. Considering the ship will have lights on, is it wise to invest in such a filter? Love the podcast and listen every week. It's oh, a nice question. Uh, I personally am on sort of don't use a filter camp myself. I don't typically use a filter, even if there are some lights around. I honestly don't think you're going to need it if you're on the deck of a ship. I mean, you're going to be... Unless you're using the ship itself as the foreground, you're probably shooting off the deck or up into the sky towards the lights. I wouldn't really worry about it. I, I think night filters can be useful both for uh, you know using telescopes as well as, as astrophotography. If you're trying to shoot something that has like a cityscape in the foreground and you want to kind of reduce some of that light bleed, but no, I, I don't think you're going to need it for this trip. I think I agree with Chris. What, I'm also team. I think no what filter. you will need is you know don't go to sleep sleep yeah. during the day yeah. and be up because i've missed a lot because it's like 4 a.m oh you should have been there it was amazing <laughs> they exploded and you're like well you well know. i was sleeping <laughs> i was sleeping jordan i agree with chris okay oh team team chris over here uh we have a speak pipe question from again jason wendling he uh sent us a question yes. a few weeks ago and uh he has another one for us so let's listen in Hey guys, Jason here with another question for you. Thanks for sharing all the absolutely wonderful information that you guys do in the podcast. Uh, this one might be a little controversial. It's about sharpness on lenses. Uh, first off, maybe share your opinions on how important you think sharpness is. And then uh, I got a little bit of a mystery for you. Um, I see MTF charts all the time that show uh, softness at the edge of the frames. And that doesn't seem to always... Uh, connect with what reviewers' opinions are. I'm wondering if field curvature might be playing a role here. And uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you all always use uh, focusing in the corner to test corner sharpness. Are MTF charts made with focusing in the corner, or is it uh, with focus in the center? Um, as an example, um, you know, like the recent Fuji. Uh, GF 55 millimeter shows pretty fast drop off in sharpness. However, most reviewers are saying it's excellently sharp. So maybe field curvature is the reason. Yeah. So I guess to answer the first question, in my opinion, I don't think sharpness is that important or, or I should say it's overrated. I mean, I think people really get on lenses have to be sharp, sharp, sharp. And I, first off, I think we're spoiled nowadays. Most lenses are actually quite sharp, uh, sharper than we need. And on top of that, it, it doesn't really affect, in a lot of cases, the actual emotive quality of the photograph, what the story is, what the subject is. And I think that's far more important. But anyways, I mean, uh, manufacturers do like to use MTF charts that show the drop off. Naturally, any lens will have more detail in the center. And as you get to the edges of the frame, it will fall off. And they can document that. Absolutely. I mean, they've got fancy machines to do it. Um, at the same time, though, you also have to consider how big the light circle is. So even though you, you do get fall off towards the edges of your frame, 
if the light circle that that lens is projecting is oversized for the sensor, then your sensor is only taking the light from the sweet spot of the lens where the fall off is actually off the side of the sensor and has no effect on the image quality. We see that a lot as a common technique where manufacturers try to deliver lenses that have better corner to edge sharpness and, and less of that fall off. It's the uh, oldest trick. We always focus in the corner ourselves for sharpness because that eliminates field curvature where you know your center might be sharp, but then because the plane of focus curves, uh, it's not the same distance to the corner. You'll often get soft corners. We like to focus specifically in the corners so that we're eliminating that and really just seeing what's the resolving power. And nine times out of 10, the corners are going to be softer than the center. Uh, one thing I will mention is I believe this is still the same case. Uh, and it was asked in the question is, yeah, MTF sh charts, I believe are still shot as a single exposure. Uh, so field curvature can absolutely skew that. That's why you'll see telephotos having better MTF charts a lot of the time than ultra wide lenses. So the way we test resolution is better than MTF charts. <laughs> so you should watch and read our reviews uh, where we focus on the corners because no one is ever focusing on the center of the image when their subject is off to the corners. They're going to focus on their chosen subject. Uh, that's yeah. how photographers take pictures, and that's how we test resolution. So there you go. Perfect. All right. Next one is from Patrick M., and this is also a speak pipe, so let's listen in. Hi, Chris and Jordan. My name is Patrick, um, and I really love the letter P, so I shoot both Pentax and Panasonic cameras as well as listening to the Petapixel podcast. Um <laughs> But I shoot two different camera systems because I have, I suppose, very different requirements for um, my video cameras as you know I do for my photo cameras. And I feel that's becoming less and less common. You know, I do a lot of short film work, which I use the Panasonic S1H for um, on Jordan's recommendation. It's a really wonderful camera and I'm really enjoying using it. Um, it produces a wonderful image. But you know, I shoot the Pentax K1 Mark I and the K3 Mark III um, for my landscape and astrophotography and wildlife work. Um, which I do out in the middle of Australia quite often. So um, I need very rugged bodies that can go kind of days without a charge. I'm just wondering, you know, what's the, I suppose, the efficacy of combining into one system and how practical that is, um, you know, considering that I do have such different um, requirements on my, my two different systems. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I really feel like the there are some bodies out there that are um i mean it's funny because they chose the two pentax is very specifically <laughs> excelling at photo and their video performance is not good uh panasonic is creeping towards having better hybrid options i feel um but still if you want a high-res panasonic and a video camera they're not making one that's a good blend of those two um but you have something like the nikon z8 uh, oh, yeah. which is you know an incredible photo camera and i would happily bring on to a movie set yeah. uh, i think we're going to see more and more like that it's something that jim kind of touched on is people want to buy one thing that will handle all of their photo and video needs right. And yeah, a lot of the updates that we're seeing are like, hey, look how much better this is as a video camera in existing photo lines and vice versa for video. For some so. reason, this really angers some people. They yeah. don't like it when a new camera that is like supposed to be a stills camera has like excellent video features. And it's just like, I, yeah. it seems <laughs> weird to me to complain about that because it's not like they're taking away your photo features to add video. And features. this is exactly what Patrick needs. You yeah. know, I mean, Sony makes some nice options as well that are good hybrids, and they are certainly rugged. The only problem for Patrick is Sony doesn't have a P in it anywhere. No. Nikon, if you go with, you know, Nippon Kogaku, Nippon, you yeah. get two Ps. That's not yeah. bad. So I'm going to go with Jordan. Z8 would be a good option. Obviously, it makes sense to consolidate your gear into one system. It's certainly more you affordable, know, and like you could only have to buy one set of lenses as opposed to two. Yeah, yeah, you know, having two different bodies is tough, but the Pentax K1 is a brilliant landscape astrophotography camera, and it is rugged as hell. So uh, I, I see why you've gone with that. I don't know. Stick with the peepees. Just keep peeing yeah, all over here's, the place, here's, Patrick. Here's the thing. If it's working for you, don't change. When it mm, stops yeah. working for you, that's when you can start evaluating the field. Then you go Nikon Z8. Or whatever it is at the time, because I'm pretty sure that this will continue <laughs> to work for him for some time now. Those, both yeah, of those cameras yeah. will be just, just fine for what he's doing. Totally. But I mean, oh. wildlife work, that's that's where I could see like wildlife work and stuff. You know, the mirrorless advantage of having less gear. I think there, there are some benefits there looking forward to it. Yeah, Z8 would kick the hell out of the Pentax for wildlife work. And it's still a brilliant landscape oh, camera. Gonna, and it's a very capable video platform. You're going to so. get a, a Molotov thrown at your house, Jordan. Careful. 
from you because of watching no, your not television me. recommendation? No. Jeez, from Pentaxians. Oh, right. Me. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to Never Read the Comments, the section where we make sure we always read the comments and we, we get through them regardless of what the mean things they say about us. Uh, on last <laughs> week's podcast, I, I went in there and I read every comment. I did it. And uh, oh. one that I wanted to point out because it made me feel good, and these are rare, is from Chris W443, who says, Jaron, having an editorial firewall is something that's been lost in network mm-hmm. news for a long, long time. I've only had one station I've worked at have that firewall between reporters and talent that you have. It's the way it was, it's the way it should be, and it's the way it needs to be. Kudos for that. You are welcome. Thank I you, will, Chris. I will keep that firewall up as long as I need to. Man, guys named Chris are just always so good, and oh we should God. always respect their opinions <laughs> and their recommendations. Especially on like what television shows they tell us to watch. Sure, whatever you want. All right, fishing, anything like uh, related to the haptic trigger on the Sony camera. Uh, KC three V. FL says, new shutter button idea. A needle popping up on the button will let you know the shot was taken. The blood from the needle powers the Dracula batteries in the camera. Simple. Of course, you shoot action stuff with a lot of bursting. You'll have to have some blood plasma handy. I'm, I don't know what to say about that. I'm going to go with it's a, it's a Halloween-inspired theme. Um, <laughs> I just did that sure because it was silly. I'm sure there's a small target audience that would actually really appreciate that. It too. got a, a fair number of, of thumbs ups, which is yeah, why I, I, I think it's it. a compelling idea. I do think it would be nice if you could power the camera with conventional batteries, but just have like a small uh, blood donations bag attached to it as well. So you could be killing two birds with one stone. Oh, uh, uh, I think that would be a solution. Yeah, or right. um, you know, your camera could just buzz a little bit when you take like, a picture. A real that problem. would also be a good option. These aren't real options. Batteries only work at night. <laughs> uh, last one in, from last week's pod is from Austin Green Explores. I'd actually really like to hear Chris and Jordan's take on the Samyang 85mm f1.8 RF, one of the best RF lenses to date, which, by the way, you can't acquire anymore. Yep. It's tack sharp, yeah. affordable, has great autofocus, beautiful bouquet, and was removed from the market by Canon lawsuits. Technically, it was a threat of a lawsuit, I believe, over their reverse engineering of RF autofocus mechanisms. Petapixel never made any mention of this event. I'll get to that. And I don't believe the lens ever got a review by the team. I'll also get to that. I regularly choose it over my Canon L glass and would argue it's one of the best budget RF lenses out there. You're probably right. Yep. Here's why we didn't cover it. Sam Young never said anything until it was too late. And then on top of that, um, Sam Young never said anything about it, which is different than what we got from other manufacturers who actually like said something that's why we eventually brought it up and this is what that but this really was the start of the 85 millimeter that this 85 millimeter started the thing like canon's not letting anyone make anything for our amount Mm -hmm. um but sam yang doesn't talk to anyone as far as i know we don't have a relationship with sam yang despite the fact they're in the l man alliance we've asked the l man alliance hey can we like talk to someone over there they seem to make cool stuff nothing uh, we would have to purchase these these lenses, uh, which we can theoretically do. Um, unfortunately, this one is no longer purchasable yeah. uh, for the aforementioned lawsuity reasons. So, did you guys ever see this thing? No, I'm I, I'm, I'm with Austin Green Explorers. I'd actually really like to hear Chris and Jordan's take on the Samyang 85 mil 1.8 <laughs> as well. Yeah, uh, if there's someone in Canada who was able to acquire (laughs) one before this happened, fire it over to us. We'll cover the shipping and I will totally take a look at that because that lens has an excellent reputation. I mean, we could look at an E-mount version as well, but the fun would be in having contraband optics, which are banned by the man. That would be really exciting. Put it on an R5 or something, just dirty, dirty boys. I'll put it out there. If you have one and you're in North America... Not just Canada, North America. <laughs> well, I'm not covering Anyone, the shipping then. <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I will. Jared will drive to your house, pick it up, drive up here, <laughs> drop it off. It'll I will look at done. the shipping costs and determine how much of that, right. if if we can cover it, depending on where you are. But yeah. and we'll only uh, scratch it three or four times. I promise they won't. Mm, I don't don't leave nah, with that. Don't say we won't. We might. That's oh, true. You, you might. <laughs> They'll try and be careful with it. Uh, yeah, let us try. know. We would love to look at that. I think that would be fun for them to actually have a contraband lens. So let's 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 try and make <laughs> that happen. Uh, last few questions here. This one is uh, from the OM one fifty to four hundred millimeter video from Question Everything. Oh, six eight. Can anyone give any insight on how this lens performs on Panasonic cameras? 
I shoot Panasonic mostly because video is one of the main things that I shoot, but I do want to get into shooting sports. My problem is Panasonic has nothing quite as fast and long as this, yep. aside from the 200 mm-hmm. So, I did it. Yeah. Yes, Jordan, you did it. So tell him, how's it, how's it work? Yeah, I used it on the G9 II. Autofocus was brilliant with it. Uh, I was filming uh, sheepdogs, chasing sheep, uh, which is a pretty challenging subject. And uh, yeah. yeah, autofocus performance on it was great. What I fought with a little bit is uh, initially I had the lens stabilization enabled. That's what I typically do with telephotos. And obviously the lens and camera won't talk to each other for stabilization. Um, that's one of the big issues with micro four thirds, I would say. And what I found with the lens enabled is it really reminded me of like Panasonic's tripod mode where it's trying to keep it rock solid, but I was trying to pan, uh, and it didn't matter which mode of the stabilization I selected. So I switched it over to the camera's IBIS unit using this lens and that actually worked great. So if you're looking to have it stay very solid for photography, then I would say, yeah, use the lens-based stabilization. It did a really good job there. But if you're planning to use it for video, which if you already have a Panasonic is probably an interest of yours, then I'd switch over to the IBIS unit. And then you can actually get some nice natural looking pans. Uh, It's just a shame. I discovered that basically at the last sheepdog run of the event. So um, so if I ever go back and shoot sheepdogs with a 150 (laughs) to 400, I know the techniques now. I can really nail that. Uh, okay, next one is a comment from uh, Chris. Can you say this one? Quill, I don't know. Quill, Quilly photo. I love all your guys' work and in-depth reviews. I also think this was an excellent lens review. With that said, I'm wondering why you didn't compare it or even mention other lenses in the same focal range or use case. I know sensor size debates are sketchy territory. However, with higher megapixel camera bodies, there are other telephoto lenses that can obtain similar field of view, achieve increased light gathering capabilities, weigh nearly the same and have the same length or similar and cost less. Examples that come to mind are the Canon R5 with the 100-500L, the Nikon Z series cameras with the 600-F63, the Sony camera with the 200-600, etc. I know it would be more time intensive, yes, and probably a long review, also yes, but it would be fascinating and informative to see a comparison video describing the pros and cons across these different camera lens combinations. Sure. I, I think that, you, you know, Jaron basically say that it would be a lot of work, which is not really the issue, but it's it's also, although fascinating, quite limited in, in how much of a practical use case it would have. Just because, of course, micro four thirds, as you say, people are, are usually going to be looking at, they're already in that system, this is for them, or you're already into another. And that really goes for even doing like Canon R5 against an Icon Z with the 600. I mean, we could do those comparisons too. Yeah, I, I don't know. When we it do lens reviews, we, we try to do comparisons to something that is in that same system uh, yeah. because I think that's more valuable for the majority of people. This might be a fun one to go out and do, but I find it interesting the recommendations you had. They're not going to get you to 800 millimeters. Um, no, he said you'd have to use a tele- teleconverter. Exactly, yeah. converters on there as well, which again makes it difficult because now we're reviewing the quality of the converter as well as the quality of the optic. Yeah. Makes it tough to do apples to apples, and that's why we haven't done it, but it could be, you know, a fun video to do with mentioning all of those caveats uh, later, but it would be a separate dedicated video because there's so much to touch on getting yeah. to the end of the video and being like, and now let's compare it to a full frame sensor. It's going to take us six minutes to explain all the qualifications of comparing these two systems. That's outside the scope of a review. And we'd only it, scratch the surface. It really muddies the topic at hand. So that yes, with like does. coming from um, like editorial, what I'll say is when I have people ask me how they should review something, and this is the same guidance that I give Chris and Jordan, even though they need very little help from me most of the time, try not to compare too much in a review your a review just a, you can do comparisons separately we actually encourage that but in a review you're trying to look at a product on its own merits and where it sits in its particular niche if you try and do too much you end up with a very muddy disjointed review that doesn't necessarily help the people that were considering that product you're looking at to begin with and as chris said if you're considering this lens you're probably in micro four thirds already knowing how it compares to a z8 with a specific 600 millimeter on it does not help you very much you don't care you're there for the micro four thirds so that's why but you do bring up a good point it is an interesting concept for a comparison just to see like where does everyone stand right now when you want to get 800 millimeters on a specific sensor yeah maybe that's something we'll do 
We'll How about, about if we issue. just never return the 150 to 400 and then we'll have it ready to do that comparison at go. any possible moment? That's Drop a good that. option, right? <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like a plan. All right, two more. <laughs> These are both speak pipe. The first one is from Kendon Kurosu. Hey, guys. I was a longtime Nikon DSLR shooter, previously owned the D850. I now own the Fujifilm X-T4 after selling all my Nikon gear. I'm pretty much just an enthusiast. Occasional video here or there, that's the reason I went to the X-T4. Checked all the boxes at the time. Small, sleek, compact, aesthetic. Um, you know, any reason you would go to Fujifilm is why I went. The travel-friendly, street photography, um, landscapes, good. It really covers all areas that I needed. But I really do miss Nikon files and now Nikon coming out with a ZF and having that same aesthetic almost as Fujifilm in terms of the way the camera looks but even better hybrid features I would say I'm just really enticed by it even though I really don't need it and but that missing and wanting of the Nikon files is really really grabbing a hold of me and I don't know if it's just gas and I should let this gas pass. But I guess I just wanted to know you guys' thoughts and um, if you've ever been in a similar situation. But yeah, just want to say also, I miss Chris's pee pee puns. I vote we should bring them back. All right. Thanks, guys. No, absolutely yeah. not. No, we're not bringing no back more pee pee no, puns. No pee pee puns. That's I'm with, uh, I'm with, first, I'm with Kendon uh, uh, Kurosu, and I think you, we should bring the pee pee puns back. And I think you should also get in touch with Patrick M., who is also a speak pipe <laughs> commenter on this episode. Because he, he really loves the peas. Pee. Yeah. And you guys could talk about pee and gas all day long. <laughs> Can you answer the question? <laughs> oh, the question. All right. I thought that was the question. Um, uh, you know, I don't know what to tell them. I mean, we are talking, of course, full frame versus an APS-C camera as well, which does change the whole thing about like what kind of lenses you're going to be looking at, what kind of photography do you want to do. But from a, I'm assuming like more of a street sexy companion camera, they're both beautiful. I really like the ZF. I mean, I think they've done something quite unique there, not just aesthetically, but also with its capabilities, with the, the new features, the image quality is beautiful. I get that. I, I know a lot of people love Fujifilm uh, film simulations and the look of the JPEGs, and that's totally valid. I agree with a lot of those. Uh, but I think Nikon do have beautiful files. I mean, I, I really do. So I get it. Ah, I don't know. Have I ever been in a similar situation? Not really. I guess I'm pretty fortunate that next week it is going to be a new camera, so I, I get to try it. But at the same time, it's it's the reverse. Sometimes I wish I could just stick with one camera that I enjoy and and just really get to uh, to hone that and enjoy that. But I don't know what to tell you, man. Yeah, get the ZF and and try them both. I, a lot of these questions come the down garbage. to how much a disposable income you have and how willing you are yeah. to completely change everything you have <laughs> and what kind of photography you do. Yeah, yeah. Jordan, do you have anything to add? No, if they like working with the raw files from the Nikon, like I do think Fujifilm, the raw files are much more easy to work with now. Um, but yeah. there are still a lot of people who have issues with them. Um, then just the amount of time you can save working with a file format you really like uh, can totally be worth it. I mean, I can say, you know, I stick with Panasonic for quick turnaround work because I'm very comfortable working with their file types, the V-Log profile. Uh, I know they'll edit well. Um, so yeah, and there are certainly some cameras out there like Sony has better autofocus at this point. Nikon have a lot of really compelling features on it, but uh, having an easy time in post, it can be the most important thing. And if you really like those Nikon files, that might be worth it. All I know is, you know, personality wise, if it was me, I do this a lot where I'll have a thought in my head like, oh, I really miss the feel of that or the look of that. And it will bother me and bother me. And I know that even if I try to push it off and and ignore it, it's Pass just going to keep coming back until I do it. So it depends on how disciplined you are and, and how um, how much you can you can just hold back those feelings. For me, I would do it in a heartbeat because otherwise I'm just going to waste hours and hours of sleepless nights wondering what if I'm bad that way. Don't do as I say. Or do as I say. I don't know. Not as I don't do. do as I do. You know that expression <laughs> that we all know. Do that. You know. That, yeah, that yeah. thing. All right. Yeah. Last question is from Micah Trailer, And I actually really like this question because it's one that I think uh, that a lot of people will run into. So let's listen in. Oh, what's up, y'all? So I really just wanted to ask 
if you were to go back and pick up a couple of older DSLR or mirrorless cameras, which would you choose? I know Chris and Jordan made a similar video back on DP Review where they went to Petapixel's preferred used camera retailer, KEH. Shout out KEH.com. But I found myself wishing you guys had discussed more cameras in that video. Um, mostly because like my city has no camera stores. So I'm finding I have to rely on digital reviews for my used camera purchases. But the majority of these reviews speak very much so in the context of the time. And it's getting harder and harder to find resources providing a more modern context of these older technologies. Like, you know, autofocus in 2012 isn't the same as autofocus was in 2018, which isn't the same as autofocus is now in 2023. So I would just like to know, like, what what cameras you guys would choose um, if you were picking these older cameras today. I know what I would pick, one. but I'm curious go what you it. guys would pick. No, I want you guys to go first. Okay, uh, I have one, which is the Samsung NX1. When that was first <laughs> launched, you could not edit the files. Um, oh, like that's right. H.265 was not Didn't hardware exist. optimized on anything. So you'd have to convert everything over to QuickTime. I, I hated uh, it. It was that. a nightmare. Um, and now that that is the standard and our computers can just breeze through H.265 files, I wonder if I would, you know, really enjoy looking at that camera without knowing every time I pushed the little red button that I was looking at a half hour of yeah. processing to turn oh, it into man. something usable. And I would really love to compare to that 16 to 50 F2 to 2.8 uh, was a very special optic, but there wasn't much to compare it to. Now I would love to see how that lens still stacks up to this day. So you same thing. If NX1. you got an NX1 kicking around, <laughs> I'd love to do a, we review it. I think eight years later, nine years later, something Man, like that. It is while, incredible while you're <laughs> how far ahead, and by head, I mean like they were too far ahead with H.265 yeah. they were. Just yeah. so, like years, years Yeah, and if you ahead. look at those specs now, if they released an APS-C camera with them, you'd be like, yeah, that's still totally competitive. Yeah. It's incredible how far ahead they were. And too while far. you're at it, go get some Sangyang 85mm 1.8 RFs and some Canon EOS M6 Mark II. Send them all, all to me in one big yeah. box. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> Chris, what is what is your camera from the past that you still would pick? I'm going to be a bit more practical. Um, I would I would look at something like Nikon D750. I think that's a great class. You almost said the one I was going to pick, but you didn't. Uh, yeah, that. like yeah. if you want, you know, D500 is kind of interesting too. But that's the one. The <laughs> oh! D500. You know, in a heartbeat, yeah. I would shoot that again because there I go. It's a nice that camera. Auto, that autofocus is still <laughs> outstanding. We should Love shoot it out camera. against an NX1. That would be fantastic. The in two a, best oh, APS-C cameras. A moving Jordan, it's subject. It's never going to happen. I'm sorry. The 3D focus in the D500 would absolutely destroy the Samsung. I guarantee you that camera is ah uh, mm, uh. yeah. Anyway, sorry, you know, Chris. from a practicality standpoint, the, that whole series, like, you know, you can get them for good prices now. The 500, the 750, the 800, the 810s, the 850s, all fantastic SLRs, all still very usable today. Um, a mirrorless camera that I would go back to, other than the M6 Mark II, which I, I think I like better than anybody else on this planet. Well, I don't know. Well, now's a good time to buy an M6 Mark II, pick up the last pieces. And hold on if to you them. Still can, yeah. If you can find them, maybe I should get one. I think that's a decent answer. M6 yeah. Mark II. There you go. Yeah. So um, we got Jordan with the camera that is probably impossible to find now, and a lens that also is impossible to find, but you know, mythical. Yeah. I'm going with the D500, which I'm sure you can still find. Uh, Keh, I promise you, Keh has that. And then Chris is going with uh, the newly I mean, D750 slash D800 series. Yeah. No, you said M6. Oh, that too. As a mirrorless. I mean, okay. you know, yeah. I mean, you know, come on. All right. Well, <laughs> that is a good place to end it. Um, thank you guys for joining us again for another episode of the Petapixel podcast. Thanks again to OM it. System for sponsoring this episode. And also, you should definitely enter their thing so you can go to Iceland. That sounds awesome. Please do it for us. We'll Send us a postcard. <laughs> and then visit the Yellow Mountains in Anhui province uh, and take photos like Wang Wushan. A uh, different trip, probably, though. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Catch you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.